yeah, I'm here to talk about naming, um, naming companies, products, product architectures, maybe babies. I'll ad lib that part, but we'll get there. Um, so yeah, uh, I work at a company called The Hundred Monkeys. That's six eighths of us. Um, we're a naming company based in Berkeley, across the bay. Um, and we've been in business for about 20 years now, uh, which is a long time for companies around here. Um, and so just a little bit like top line about naming, um, you know, my idea is that naming is essentially the most ubiquitous piece of marketing your company will ever make. Um, and that's because one, it has kind of uncommon staying power relative to campaigns, logos, things like that. Um, but two, it goes absolutely everywhere, um, including in conversations, which is a cool place uh, where lots of us like to uh, talk with each other. And uh, most other elements of your brand can't really exist in that format in a non-offensive way. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the power of naming. People talk about word of mouth uh, in a functional sense, the element that's being conveyed is your name. Um, so uh, yeah, like taking a look at Lego over the years, starting in 1934 in Belgium, I think. Oh no, Denmark, it says it right there. Um, and uh, you know, you see that they kind of changed a lot of things over time. Pictures of kids in their logo, uh, red, pretty, omnipresent, but um, it's been Lego the entire time throughout the world. That part has never changed. Look at other brands like that, Coke, where everyone likes to show what, how their logos kind of transitioned over time. They had a moment of insanity in the mid 80s where they tried to actually call themselves Coke um, instead of Coca-Cola, but now they're back. Um, so yeah, it's kind of uncommon staying power. Um, which is really interesting for an element of your brand that you tend to pick when you're really new. Um, so, like, you know, you might be making this decision before you have a single customer, yet theoretically it should be the name that exists, you know, when you go public and do everything else that your company may or may not do. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of this interesting little anchor point for all of the experiences that people have with your brand. Um, you know, which is to say your name means something, has some kind of like implicit association on day one, but then every experience that people have with your brand informs how people perceive that word. It's living in that way. Um, and so, you know, can you call your company or, or product anything? Um, no. <laughs> Um, so why not? Uh, because bad names are everywhere. Um, and so I want to take a look at kind of some of the common reasons why bad names are bad, and then halfway through flip it to talk about um, why good names are good. Because we don't want to be negative the whole time. That's not a nice way to hang out. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Um, here are seven reasons why bad names are bad. Uh, and we're going to go through them one by one and look at some examples. Uh, so the first one, uh, your name is unownable. Do any of you guys know where this picture comes from? Yeah. Right, yeah. Car landed in a second story window and stayed there and nobody got hurt. Um, so, you know, that's cool. Um, so, you know, this idea that your name is unownable, um, probably the easiest mistake to avoid in most cases, um, which is, you know, essentially that uh, a lot of people just decide, hey, I'm going to call my company this, or I'm going to call my product this, and don't actually see if they can legally own it or use it. Um, and so that's always a good thing to do, to check to make sure you can actually use your name. But then even in these cases, like this is, you know, one big company going after another big company. Um, you know, word to the wise, try not to use Sky in your name because Sky goes after everybody. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of like the practical reality of the situation that, you know, you register in trademark classes, different countries in the world. There's the US, European Union has its own thing. We can get like deep into trademark stuff, but that would be pretty boring. Um, but, you know, really when you break it down, there's kind of the idea of registering your name, meaning, hey, like, 
I'm doing business with this word. Um, and you know, even then, some big companies can come after you just because they have a ton of resources. Uh, but typically, a pretty good place to start to make sure that you don't decide to call yourself something and then get a letter in the mail like three months, six months, a year later saying, hey, you can't use that anymore. Then you need to start over, um, which isn't too fun. Um, another kind of variant of this is uh, having names that are really tough to show up for. Um, searchability, we call it. So if I, like a couple days ago, I just Googled Ace, like you do. Um, and this is what showed up. Um, so we have a few things. Um, we have Ace Hardware. We have American Cinema Editors, which was founded in 1950. Um, and a playing card thing in the corner. And then there's like a bunch of other companies named Ace, right? There's like Ace Hotels. They're not on here at all. Um, and so, you know, can you call your company? If you opened a company in a you know, new industry that's not using the word ace at all, could you do that? Yeah, probably. Um, but you wouldn't show up anywhere because it's a really competitive word. Um, so because you're using a word that a lot of other people use, just kind of means you have to fight upstream to get noticed, um, which, you know, up to you whether that's worth it or not. Um, but ends up, in a lot of cases, being more trouble than it's worth. Um, next one, your name is predictable. Um, I took this picture on a business trip in South Korea last year, I think. Um, everybody's doing this now. They pick one word, and then they put an ampersand there, and then they pick another word. <laughs> and I think you can pick any two words. I'm not entirely sure how it works. But I think you just pick one, and then you do the ampersand, and then you pick any other one. And that's a way that you can name a business. Um, like another local example, uh, this place just opened up by my place in, uh, in Oakland. Um, I guess you can eat birds and buffaloes at this place. Um, it's not so abnormal. Uh, but so you know, the main issue here is that these names are trend, right? Um, just like how like maybe a decade ago people were dropping vowels from their names, um, you know, this is a new trend. Um, and people just you know, have this little formula, and you can sort of stamp it out a ton of different ways. The problem is like my first point, right, that names should last the entirety of your business. Um, these names will feel very evocative of a particular time. Um, they will just be locked in the time when people did this. People aren't going to keep doing this forever. This is going to stop. Um, hopefully super soon, um, but like maybe in a couple years. And then at that point, then the kind of character of your brand stops at that same time. You just sort of feel you know, of that period in the same way Tumblr um, you know, still around, but just kind of feels that name feels you know, of a particular time. Um, your name is too descriptive. Probably the most common one um, would be my guess. Uh, people do this, I think, because they get uh, afraid that people aren't going to know what they do, um, which is a, a common fear. Um, here's an example, CompUSA. You guys remember CompUSA? So their name was here to tell you that they sell computers in the United States, <laughs> um, which is a super pertinent piece of information that didn't help them when they went out of business. Um, and so you know, a lot of people do this, where they try to just describe what they do or use the name to describe what they do. It's a problem for a bunch of reasons. The main reason is that like, your name is a fairly finite, like, small thing. Um, and because of that, you don't have like, a lot of room to communicate these like, grand, complex ideas. So if you use that to kind of describe what you're doing, you're sort of just like wasting that option because most people will get what you're doing via context. Like you walk into a CompUSA, you're like, oh shit, there's computers here. Um, <laughs> you know, like you figure it out. And so they don't do anything to communicate any sense of like character, personality, ideology, belief, nothing. You get nothing from them, um, which is boring. Uh, and also the other thing is like people talk about startups and new companies pivoting all the time. So when you pivot, then the description of what you do changes. And then so your name doesn't reflect what you do anymore. Um, 
Growth is another reason why that happens, right? How many times do companies sort of exist in a space for a while and say, hey, we need to like grow our market share or do something new? Um, like I was driving behind like a couple weeks ago this truck and it said the water store uh, and then underneath it it said we sell coffee and soda too. Um, it's like, thank you, I get it now. So they have to say that on everything. Um, so another one, um, your name is Word Smash. Word Smash is a term that we maybe invented, maybe not, I'm not gonna take credit for it, um, where you just take two words and then you just slam them together. Um, <laughs> and uh, I guess the theory behind this might be something like people will place you at the intersection of these two words conceptually, um, but like nobody does that. Um, you know, like when you hear Verizon, you don't sort of break it into its component parts or Comcast. It just kind of exists as that weird little unit, and you don't really think too much more about it. It just hangs out there. If you have like, you know, millions and millions of dollars to like jam that word into people's heads, then, you know, that can work okay for you. Um, but really it's like not doing a good job for you from a marketing point of view, um, because you don't really get anything out of it. So like this is an engaging agency, or an agency that does engagements, maybe, um, saying that they're like in business, I guess. Um, so yeah, not a lot to really go off of there. Um, this one, this one's bad. Don't do a naming contest um, for a bunch of reasons. First reason, 4chan. Um, and uh, like, this is like an actual contest that Mountain Dew ran to name something. Um, and you know the other reason is that it just breeds like everything sounding the same. Um, and I'm using Virgin kind of as a counterexample here. That like, who would name an airline that? Um, it's just crazy. Um, it's like this idea that like, you know, Virgin, like we've never done this before. <laughs> Hop on our plane. Um, but. It works, right? So you take these like common things that people should be scared of, but really all it serves to do is differentiate them immediately, right? You look at a list of airlines, their name pops out every single time because people just use bullshit terms for, you know, they like really obvious stuff like, you know, birds uh, or using like sky or flight or just like anything that, you know, builds off of that concept. And so then you just have this clustering of people essentially using the same language. And then so when you use different language, even language that like should be shooting yourself in the foot or something, it stands out. And then they have the experience to back that up, right? To build that into a whole kind of character and personality. Um, so yeah, don't be descriptive. Um, this one's fun. Misspelling. A lot of people like to misspell names. Mostly I think to get URLs. At least that's why they used to do it. Now I don't know if you have an excuse. Um, here's a fun example. Um, so <laughs> uh, all of these companies are attempting to convey simplicity by spelling the word simpler incorrectly. Unless you have IBM cache, then you can spell it in English. Um, but so what do you get here, right? One, like, that's not simple, obviously, right? Not spelling a word correctly is not the simplest way you could approach it. But two, the, the real problem here is that like this S-I-M-P-P-L-R, simpler, that's not your name. Your name is not simpler. Your name is simpler S-I-M-P-P-L-R. You have to spell it every single time because otherwise like how are people gonna go to you instead of you instead of you instead of you? So when you misspell your name, most of the time what you're doing is you're ensuring that you're gonna actually have to misspell it for everyone for the rest of your life. Um, so don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Um, okay, so now this is a bit different. We're talking a bit about product naming here, um, sort of a specific product naming issue, um, which happens a lot. So this is the Huawei lineup of phones. Um, I'm not really calling them out specifically. I think most phone companies do this and most technology companies, period. Um, so 
this is like, you know, click on phones. These are, you know, the first 10 phones that show up. Um, I have no idea which the best phone is, or what the newest one is, or what their relationships are to each other, really. I can tell that some of them say honor, so then maybe I'm to believe that the highest number honor is either the newest one or the best one. Some of them are appended with letters. Some of them don't have words in the middle, just go Huawei straight to alphanumerics, alphanumerics plus suffixes. Uh, and so really you just create this like messy rubber band ball situation of like a bunch of words that don't help anybody distinguish or navigate your portfolio. Um, and when you have a lot of products and you want people to you know, wayfind and find the product that's right for them and what they want, it's usually helpful to use names to help people understand what they're looking at. Um, it takes on more of a functional role at this point. Like I'm not advocating for all of these to have these like, you know, ridiculous like standout names. Um, contrary to popular belief, like we don't like to name everything. Like sometimes it's not in your best interest to do that. Um, this would be one of those cases. So it would just be helpful to understand something here about what they're trying to communicate, um, of which I get about nothing. Um, so, okay, enough negative stuff. Um, Let's flip all this stuff around and talk about uh, what makes good names. Um, so uh, your name should be ownable, right? This is the opposite of the trademark issue. Um, so yeah, use a trademark attorney. They're not that expensive. Um, they're pretty cheap. Like you can get a name trademarked in the US for like 1200 bucks. Um, that's not too bad compared to having to start over later. Um, and you know, the other element of that is just to use that as an opportunity to say something interesting or different or weird. Um, this is one of my favorite names. Uh, it's a Japanese technology company um, that makes very cool looking products. But their name is just this really interesting thing. I mean, one, it's long, which most people are afraid of. Um, but because of that, they get to sort of place these ideas against each other, right? Teenage, which has some kind of like fun, you know, try it out type of thing with engineering, which is just very like, you know, hard and technical. Um, but when you put them together, it just sort of says they're using engineering to fun, interesting ends. Um, and that feels interesting. And more than interesting, it's like totally ownable. Nobody's after that, right? The only people they're competing with, like in SEO, is like some, you know, after school engineering program at a high school. Um, so, like, you know, pretty available. Um, your name should be a point of differentiation. Um, so, you know, a lot of people approach naming to fit in. Um, it's like the same as naming your kids something that a lot of other kids are named, um, just so they don't get beat up because they have a weird name. Um, but, you know, when it comes to naming, like, the idea is to stand out. Um, which is sort of counterintuitive. Like if you're starting a business, you see other people in the area, you're like, I want to be like them. I want to have a successful business like they do. Um, that doesn't really apply to your name. Um, because really, if you name to fit in with everyone else, then you're immediately going to turn around and spend a bunch of marketing money on trying to prove to everyone why you're different. So why don't you just let them know you're different with your name, and then communicating that ends up being pretty easy. So if you look at like certain industries, right, like law, like, how do law firms name themselves? Yeah, last names, right? Real estate. Yeah, same kind of deal, a lot of last names. Aviation, we talked about that one. Birds, sky stuff. Um, but so when everybody clusters like that, it's super easy to just go any other direction. You can literally, like, you know, go anywhere else and you're standing out. Um, in other industries, that's a lot more difficult, right? Like beer, wine, music. People are okay with cool, weird, interesting stuff in those industries. And because they are, it becomes a lot more difficult to stand out. Um, almost like doing something boring might be more effective in those situations because people aren't willing to do it. Um, so uh, these are the uh, top routers on Amazon as of Tuesday. Um, we named one of these routers. Um, anybody guess which one? Yeah, Eero. Um, 
It's the shortest. It's the only one that doesn't use any alphanumerics. Um, standing out here was incredibly easy, um, which was nice. It's nice when people make our job easy like that. Um, bonus points to the Netgear Nighthawk A1600. Um, that's a badass router. I don't know that you want that in your home, um, but if you did, it would, I don't know, be a hawk at night. Um, and so the, it's kind of this like weird thing where like you're supposed to put this at your house um, and in a prominent place, right? Because you want to get like signal everywhere, so you need to like put your router in a place where it can distribute signal well. And then they like make it look like this. Um, and then it has like the name and language to match, right? It just, everything about it seems kind of like engineering and techie um, and like Terminator 2. Um, when that's kind of sort of appealing to their audience, appealing to the people they hang out with, um, not appealing to a consumer audience to whom they're selling this to. Um, contrast that with Eero. Um, it's just, you know, a cute little thing that they put on a slice of wood on a shelf. Um, <laughs> everybody should put their router on a slice of wood on a shelf. <laughs> that's the key takeaway tonight. Um, so your name should get a response. Um, this is one of the easiest things to gauge. When you tell someone your name, you just look at their face and you see what they do. Um, when I tell people that I work at 100 Monkeys, um, they always ask me a question. Um, and that's a really big benefit to a name. I think a lot of people, you know, especially people who sort of think a name should be descriptive, fall into this camp of like, you know, well, if someone doesn't get it, then we're screwed. But nobody gets what we do when I say my name. And that gets them to ask a question, and then I get to explain exactly what I do. And so the name opened me up to a pitch. That's like almost the best thing a name can do for you. Um, get someone to have an engaging conversation with you about what you're working on. Um, so yeah, responses, good. Laughing, smiling, all good responses. Those things also, by the way, aid in memorability, which is another important thing that names can do. Um, if people can't remember your name, then they can't tell other people about it. Um, so yeah, responses, memorability. Um, so yeah, one cool example of that. You see the thing at the top of the screen? Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, it's a big ass fan. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is like, this is the best way to be descriptive um, because it's being descriptive in a way that nobody would ever claim. And that's why it's cool and that's why it works. And it's so, it's, it's sort of like, this is what breaks the descriptive rule because um, they're just doing it in such an unexpected way um, and they get huge business off of that. Um, so your name should relate to the big picture. It's kind of the opposite of the descriptive point. Um, that, you know, if you have some sort of ideology or reason why you're working on what you're working on, doing what you're doing, striving to change an industry, you know, anything like that, um, if your name kind of operates on that level and helps you tell that story, that has a much better chance of not changing over time. And even if it did, it's sort of not so easy to tell. Um, you can kind of take that ideology and pivot it to other areas a lot easier. Um, if you describe what you do, that doesn't work at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is a, a project we did a couple years ago. Um, this is a company based out of the UCSF Rock Health Center down here. Um, and they do something really cool, which is allow people with diabetes to actually control their data. Um, which you think, hey, that, sh that sounds normal. People should be able to do that. Um, but that's not what happens because all of these little devices like glucose monitors um, and, you know, uh, are, they're basically like siloed technologically speaking. A company makes that thing and they make the software that's on it and so that's their software and they control it. And if you switch to another company, then tough luck. Like you don't have all of your blood sugar data anymore. Um, so they're out to change that. Um, and so we could have used a name that had something to do with diabetes, um, but we didn't because 
people will get that from communicating with them. It's a very like high need for a niche audience, so that fit tends to work out on its own. Um, but then, you know, this data problem in medicine doesn't only exist for diabetes. So what if they try to go after, you know, another condition, another disease? We want the name to work there. Um, so it's really just kind of about planning for the future. In terms of what the name means, I mean, you know, tide pools are just these really kind of interesting uh, little biomes where there's a lot of different types of life. Things are kind of always moving and changing, um, but it's just kind of a, a really dynamic environment. Um, and you know, they, they really kind of latched onto that idea. Um, so your name should be chosen by a, a very small group of people. Uh, large groups of people do not make good creative decisions. Um, generally, that's not just a naming thing. Um, I worked in design before. I worked in naming, and that happened there too. Um, we call it the ice cream principle, which is to say that if you send 10 people to get ice cream, but you tell them that they have to agree on a flavor, it's going to be chocolate or vanilla every time. Um, and now, like, are chocolate or vanilla the best ice cream flavors? No, but they're what people agree on, right? So if you make naming an exercise in agreement, you get boring shit. Um, so you know, when you make decisions with much smaller groups, the likelihood that you end up somewhere interesting goes up. Um, and so creative decisions just aren't best when they're made by large groups, um, you know, especially dealing with something as subjective as naming. Like you look at these names, Virgin, Apple, Outdoor Voices, um, too easy to find a dissenting voice on any of those names. Um, and so they only happen in small groups. Um, this is a brewery we worked on in, uh, in the mission. Um, you know, perfect example of that, right? Um, kind of funny that it's across the street from the kink building. Um, but, like, you know, a group of people wouldn't agree on that, right? They'd be uncomfortable with it. Someone would be, and that sort of dissenting opinion would be enough to throw it off the table. Um, OK, so then a few quick things I want to hit. Uh, things to stop worrying about. These are like kind of the most common things that people come to us worrying about. Like, how am I going to get a URL? How am I going to get social media handles? Like, this name needs to be short or pronounceable. Um, so let's just work through a couple quick examples there. Um, Tesla. Tesla was at teslamotors.com until they had three cars out. Um, <laughs> did that stop them? Did people not find their way to their URL? No, it worked fine. Nobody directly types in URLs anymore. Um, they search for you. And so it's much more of a searchability question than it's a URL question. Um, lots of big companies at alternate TLDs, Alphabet at abc.xyz. It's an enormous company that doesn't have alphabet.com. They don't even care to. Um, so yeah, don't worry about URLs. That'll solve itself. Um, social media handles. All sorts of examples of like big companies and people who don't use their own name for social media. It's totally fine. People find you. You get the little check mark. It's going to be OK. Um, long names. So everybody comes to us saying that they want short names. I think because they just have this kind of like punchy one syllable thing in mind. Um, but I find long names to be a lot more interesting and capable of conveying a lot more diverse set of meaning. Um, that you can get a much more nuanced idea across with a longer name. Um, so this name is like five words. Um, and like three of them are longer words. And they do just fine. Um, another example, uh, anybody know which San Francisco ice cream place this is? Mr. and Mrs. Miscellaneous. Um, yeah. So that's a long name. And it's fun to say, and it's interesting. And you won't forget it, right? So there's this kind of like thing where people sort of say short and memorable all the time, like those two things go together, when in fact, um, long and memorable go together. Like people, a longer name gives you much more to grab onto, more things to remember, more kind of visual anchors, whereas a short name has a lot fewer. Um, and it's much more common that other people will be using those same anchors. So by going with something long, weird, interesting, the likelihood that people remember you actually shoots way up. Um, pronounceability. Uh, <laughs> so this is an example of a company that actually tells you how to pronounce <laughs> their name in their logo. Um, and 
So pronounceability is the same deal. People sort of think, well, if people won't be able to pronounce my name, then they'll get flustered or embarrassed and will never engage with my company ever again. Um, people mispronounce names all the time, and it's totally OK. And then you know, it's also just a very localized view, because you take any company's name and move throughout the world, and people are going to pronounce it different ways. So I think we just need to get rid of this idea that like, if someone can't perfectly pronounce your name, then it's not a good name, because that's just not a realistic expectation. Um, you know, another interesting example is this. Um, so, you know, in America, you see this and you say Nike football. Um, Nike and football, probably, you know, American football. Um, but in a lot of the world, this is Nike football, um, and they're talking about soccer. Um, so, same company, um, they have. Nike has two Nike footballs, and it means different things in different parts of the world. Um, so, you know, people are capable of holding on to that kind of flexibility and meaning and definition. Um, you know, so this idea that you have to have like complete ownership over exactly you know what your name means or how it's pronounced um, isn't true. There's just too many variables there. Um, okay, so that's kind of it for points. One thing. Um, you know, if you ever need help with this, uh, I wrote a book. It's called Don't Call It That. We have it back there. Um, it's, it's not a book about naming. It's literally a step-by-step -step guide where by the end of the book, you should have a name for whatever you're working on. Um, and yeah, it's fun. I like to see what people come up with. So if you use it to name something, let me know what you named it. Um, and also, there's a hashtag for Don't Call It That. Uh, where we put all sorts of weird naming decisions that people make. <laughs> yep. All taken locally. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, uh, last point. Um, I just did another book, which I did on Kickstarter. Um, and it's not about naming. Um, it's about running a small creative studio, because I didn't think anybody wrote a book about that. Um, and so, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time just kind of having anxiety about how to properly manage a small creative team um, and eased my anxiety by reading a ton about how other people manage businesses and, um, you know, put it into practice over a couple years and then wrote a book about it, which about 900 people supported. Um, so, yeah, uh, that should be out digitally uh, at the end of this month and in print in May. And uh, that's all I got.